Maybe we should get started. People are trickling in a little at a time, but um, that's okay. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to introduce Jessica Ross. She's a research specialist at UW-Madison. Um, she's worked on a wide variety of ecological and conservation research projects in the Midwest, as well as citizen science projects at the UW Arboretum and the Field Museum in Chicago. Um, Jessica currently serves on the board um, of the Madison Mycological Society, where she's leading a project on documenting the fungal diversity at the UW Arboretum. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to, rec or I'd like to um, introduce Jessica Ross. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to talk with you all about citizen science in your garden. Um, just to note, oh, also, um, thank you, Trish, for the introduction. I just want to say that my pronouns are she and her. Um, and also a note that uh, citizen science might be called other things. Um, you might hear it be called citizen-based monitoring or participatory science or community science. And those, it, for our purposes, are generally very similar things. So we'll, um, we won't get into the terminology, but uh, for this talk, we'll just be referring to it as citizen science. So um, thinking about citizen science, thinking about uh, what scientists do, um, one thing that they do is ask a lot of questions. So I'm going to ask everyone to put their scientist hat on and start thinking um, like a citizen scientist. Um, so I'm gonna ask you and you can uh, put what you think in the chat and we can talk about it. So what is, what is citizen science? What does that mean to you? Um, and I'll give you a little bit of time to think about it and put your answers in the chat. I know you thought you might get a, away from uh, audience participation with a virtual talk, but I love audience participation. So. I'm excited to hear to hear your opinions on this. What is citizen science? So we have one person uh, who says citizen science is citizens participating in studies or research. I think that is a great answer. That is definitely part of what citizen science is. Uh, let's see, we have someone say, that says taking pictures of bumblebees. That is a wonderful part of citizen science. And I'll actually talk about a bumblebee project in a little bit that you could all get involved in. Um, somebody else says, community members collecting data on scientific endeavors. That's very true. There's a big data collection component of citizen science. Um, so, yeah, that's definitely right. We have another person who says, um, a citizen with non-scientist background contributing to research by observations. I like the idea of observations. That's a really good word um, for scientists and citizen scientists. Um, making note of what's happening in the world. Um, through observation is a really great part of what citizen science is. Um, so thank you all for uh, your ideas and your answers. Oh, I have one more, okay. Um, so it's gathering information uh, from observations of flora and fauna and reporting what is observed um, to add to the database of information. That is a really good detailed answer. I like that too. Um, we're gonna talk about lots of ways that you all can observe flora and fauna in your gardens as well. So thank you for those answers. Um, now we'll kind of get into, before I sort of give you an answer of what I think citizen science um, is, I'll kind of give you a little bit of a history of citizen science. So when we think about sort of the foundations of science and the founding fathers, the founding members of science, we think about people like Charles Darwin, um, in his theory of evolution, of Benjamin Franklin, um, of people like William Herschel who discovered Uranus. Um, but thinking about these people, none of these people were really professional scientists. They were all just people who were curious um, and interested in the world around them. Charles Darwin was a medical school student um, and a theologian. He wasn't a biologist. He wasn't getting paid to study biology. Um, 
Benjamin Franklin was a politician. Um, he was just really excited about sort of the sciences and William Herschel um, was a musician, but he just because he was excited about it was a pioneer in astronomy. So we have these people, they're not paid to be scientists. Um, they're just really curious um, and sort of making these advances in the field of science. So then as time goes on, we get away from the idea of science kind of as a hobby. We move to this idea of science as something that you only do if you have a PhD, you do it in a lab, you need lots of fancy equipment, um, you need a lot of training, um, you are maybe a man if you're doing science as a profession, um, you don't see, you don't think about maybe a lot of diversity in the sciences. Um, and that's kind of our contemporary idea of science, somebody who has studied a lot, who gets paid to just do science. But I think moving forward and more and more now, we're, we have this new idea of who can be a scientist. So we are kind of moving away from that person in a white coat in a lab idea of a scientist. And we're thinking about scientists as anybody, anybody who is curious, anybody who's asking questions, um, anyone can make observations, um, no matter your age, uh, your gender, anything, anybody can uh, do this. So we're, we're kind of getting back to that original idea of science as a curiosity, as something anybody can do. And so this is a chart um, from a website called SciStarter. It's an online repository of these of citizen science projects. Um, and you can see on the x-axis as you can see time going on from 2009 up to more of the present, uh, you can see that these bars, there have been more and more projects added every year and in the past few years lots and lots more projects. So you can see citizen science is becoming really popular, really prevalent. Um, and you can also, we can also see this trend of an increase in the prevalence of citizen science in uh, peer reviewed publications. So even people who are trained as scientists have been using citizen science as a tool more and more you can see on this graph, um, as time goes on along the x-axis, there have been more and more peer-reviewed publications that have something to do with citizen science. And I'm sure that if we carried this chart into the present time, you would see just a continued increase in the interest in citizen science. And then here in Wisconsin, we are lucky to have a really long history of citizen science practices. Um, in Wisconsin, we, our Department of Natural Resources hosts a citizen-based monitoring network, which is really unique and special. Um, they celebrated their 15 year anniversary a few years ago. But you can see on this timeline um, that citizen science began in Wisconsin. It's not a new thing, it started uh, back in 1900 with the Christmas bird count. And you can see as time goes on, more and more projects get added, uh, more and more topics get added. There's water monitoring that happens, there's um, bat programs, there um, is a muscle monitoring program, there are plant monitoring programs, programs for insects. So lots and lots of growth. You can see projects that have to do with pretty much anything you might be curious about. Um, and another really exciting thing in Wisconsin is that through this network, there is a conference. So if you're, um, just something to note, if you're a volunteer or a citizen scientist, this might be an exciting opportunity for you to network with other folks who participate in this kind of thing. So let me get back to this question. Um, I know that was kind of a whirlwind, a whirlwind history of citizen science, um, but I want to ask again, so what is citizen science? And now I, I'm not going to give you a definition, but I'll tell you a couple things that citizen science is. 
So a lot of you, a lot of your answers to my, when I first posed this question had to do with data collection or making observations. And so I think I agree with all of you that citizen science is a wonderful tool for data collection. And to just show you an example of this, um, this all is a map um, of sandhill crane abundance in, across the United States. And all of this, the color on the map are observations made by a citizen scientist. So you can see that as the year goes on, as time moves forward, you can see the migration of sandhill cranes. You can see them um, moving northward and back southward as they migrate. And this is so many data points. This is, these are way more data than any one scientist could gather by themselves. But with the help of all of these people looking at these, uh, looking for sandhill cranes, and making these observations, you can get this really detailed picture of where they are at what time of year. And that can tell us a lot about their populations. Um, let's see. Yeah, and um, this, these kind of data are really exciting to see. Um, for, um, I'll talk more about this project, um, this platform eBird in particular, um, but in recent years, um, volunteers have had over 100 million observations on this platform each year. So we can do this for sandhill cranes, we can do this for bluebirds, we can do this for any kind of bird or any kind of organism. And it's really exciting to get to see what's going on in their population. So citizen science is a great tool for data collection. That's very true. Um, but it's not only that, it has a lot more features. So another thing that citizen science is, is it's a means of outreach and education. And I think a great example of this is the example of uh, the monarch butterfly. Um, I, I'm not sure what student um, hasn't experienced in the classroom some kind of uh, information or unit about monarch butterflies. Um, you might see displays like this monarch butterfly life cycle. You might have folks rearing monarchs in the classroom. But this uh, butterfly is so ubiquitous and we learn about it and by participating in citizen science that uh, people get really excited about it. Um, there are curricula developed um, for students, um, it uh, can teach uh, by participating students or, and this can be K through 12 students, it can be university students, it can be people who are not students, it can be retired folks, it can be anybody um, can sort of learn about research skills, um, learn about asking questions and being curious, learn about the scientific method, um, collecting data, all of those good things. And so through all of these kind of things, all of uh, the data that citizen scientists have collected and the excitement that they have over monarchs, that's led to um, this butterfly um, being brought up for listing as a federally protected organism. And without sort of the enthusiasm of citizen scientists and people learning about its life cycle, that probably wouldn't have happened. So um, this means of outreach and education can lead to really important conservation goals as well. So that's not all that citizen science is. Um, citizen science is also a wonderful opportunity for anyone to engage in scientific discovery. So I really want to emphasize that's an opportunity for everyone. Um, anyone can participate in citizen science. You just need to have uh, sort of that curiosity or that desire to ask a question or an interest. Um, that's all you need to get started. 
You generally don't need any special equipment. You um, don't need any special skills. You can learn all of these things kind of while you're doing. And especially with the advent of modern technology like smartphones, it makes citizen science really easy to participate in. There are a lot of new apps and learning tools that are free and available to the public as well. And I'll talk about some of those opportunities that you all might want to participate in your garden. But I just want to emphasize that anybody can do this. We're, we've moved away from the idea of a scientist in a white lab coat. And now we've moved to the idea of anybody can contribute in a meaningful way. So thinking about being curious and asking questions as a scientist, I wanna ask all of you, what have you seen in your garden that makes you curious? So you can go ahead and type your answers in the chat. I want you all to start thinking about what makes you excited and what could you do as a citizen scientist? All right, we have somebody says they've been raising monarch butterflies for the past three years. So it sounds like we might have folks who are already participating in citizen science. And I think raising monarchs can make you really curious. It can make you ask all sorts of questions like, why did this, like, why did this caterpillar survive? Or like, where is this butterfly gonna go when I release it? Lots of things like that. So that's great. We have somebody said pollinators are something that they've seen in their garden that makes them curious. I agree, there, there are a lot of pollinators, uh, lots of questions to be asked um, around those. We have somebody else who says they're worried about jumping worms. Are citizens monitoring this? That is a wonderful question. Um, I will talk about jumping worms later in the talk, but that is, that's the perfect example of you being curious about something, wanting to know some information, and I'll give you the tools to kind of answer that question. Um, but I can say, yes, citizen scientists are monitoring jumping worms. We can talk more about that in a little bit. Let's see, someone else said, native bees and pollinators raising monarchs bird collision court. So yeah, it sounds like some of you folks already have a good idea of some citizen science projects, but um, yeah, all of those things would be great to monitor in your garden. Someone says they're surprised about the textures and qualities of soil types in their yard. That's a really, I like to hear that because we, we hear about pollinators, we hear about things that are kind of conventionally beautiful but soil is so important and so good to ask questions about that and to be curious. Oh, you all are great participants. Thank you for all of your good answers. Um, we also have someone is curious about plants that just show up um, and how, how plants get into their garden, uh, what brought them there. Those are all really good questions. Uh, I like some of the specificity of that. Um, let's see, flowers. People like to observe birds and bird behaviors. Um, oh, someone saw two foxes in their garden uh, downtown. And they reported it to a citizen science project, which is great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, it, it's awesome how much you're already observing in your gardens, how much you're paying attention, and how curious you're being. I think you all, if you're not already an expert citizen scientist, you really have the making of being a, a wonderful participant in any of these projects. So I appreciate the participation. Um, and with that, I'll move on to a bunch of citizen science projects that you could participate in. 
This is by no means an exhaustive list. There are many, many projects that you've participated in, but hopefully some of these will sort of get at that curiosity or those questions that you're having. So first, uh, somebody talked about how citizen science to them meant um, monitoring pollinators or bumblebees. And so I'll talk about that right away. Um, bumblebee monitoring is a great project to participate in if you have a garden, uh, because your garden probably has some flowers and bumblebees are wonderful pollinators. So in Wisconsin, we have a couple of options for you to participate in. We have Bumblebee Watch, which is a national program uh, where you can observe bumblebees and upload your observations um, to that. But here in Wisconsin, I would highly recommend Bumblebee Brigade, which is a new project, a newer project uh, from the Department of Natural Resources uh, that allows you to do to upload observations of bumblebee sightings to take pictures kind of like these that you see um, and submit those observations but also do some larger area surveys of bumblebees to get an idea of what bumblebees are in wisconsin when when people are seeing them when they're around and this project bumblebee brigade um, has a really nice website with lots of resources. So this is what their website looks like. Um, there are lots of good training videos and ways to get involved. Um, there are lots of opportunities on this website to learn about bumblebees. They have really nice handouts. So this kind of gets into the learning part of citizen science. You can really learn a lot um, about bumblebees and their habitats. You can download field guides, you can watch videos, all from this website. Um, and you can learn a lot by going out in your garden and just looking too. So I would highly recommend if you're interested in bumblebees to check out this website, um, to check out the Bumblebee Brigade. Another great thing about Bumblebee Brigade is that they create these maps um, where you can see observations that other folks are submitting. So this is a map from last year of Rusty Patch Bumblebee, which is a federally listed um, bumblebee in Wisconsin. And you can see um, lots of folks across the state are observing this bumblebee. A lot of people in Madison have seen it. Um, so it'd be really exciting to kind of go out into your garden and say, oh, my garden is a habitat for this um, listed species and um, that's so that's really exciting you can uh, have your observation added to this map and see where other people are seeing certain types of bees so in addition to bumblebees another really great thing to do in your garden is observe birds and we saw that map with the sandhill crane earlier in the talk and that map was generated with data from eBird. And eBird is a website, also an app, that uh, lots of folks use to document birds they're seeing, whether, it, whether their motivation is to submit data to a bigger project or just to keep track of the birds they're seeing for their records. So on this screen, you can see I grabbed all of the observations from the UW Arboretum. And you can see what birds are being seen. You can see where they were seen, by who, um, how many there were. You can see which uh, species are seen most often. So at the Arboretum, a lot of times people see wild turkeys, they see doves, they see different kinds of woodpeckers and hawks. Um, and they can, you can upload <clears throat> your photos of these birds that you're seeing. You can uh, submit checklists and see what your friends are seeing. So it's a really great way to keep track of what you're seeing um, and when you're seeing it. And every observation you make can be used by uh, scientists who are interested in seeing, um, asking questions about bird populations um, and things like that. 
Another great bird project that you can participate in in your garden is Project Feeder Watch. And this is another great website, lots of good learning resources. Um, this project is really easy. All you do is install a feeder and count the birds that visit and then enter those data. So this is a really, a really fun one um, if you already have bird feeders up. Um, and this website gives you lots of good resources. You can say, you can type in something like, I want to attract more Orioles to my, to my garden. What kind of feeder do I need to do that? And this website will tell you. So you can kind of pick, um, you can tailor your experience to what you're interested in seeing. So this is a really nice project as well. Then one more tool that I would recommend if you're excited about monitoring birds in your garden is Merlin, which is an app um, that you can download on your phone. It's free. It's from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology who are in charge of both, both of the previous projects that I had mentioned. Um, but Merlin is a wonderful way to learn how to start identifying birds. Um, you, when you open the app, you'll see um, that you can identify birds um, from a photo or from this set of questions where it will ask you some things about the bird that you had seen, like what size was it, what was it doing, um, what colors was it, things like that. And it will give you a list of options based on your area. So that's a really nice way to, uh, if you don't know anything about birds, or even if you know a lot about birds, to start really honing your skills and learning um, how to identify things. And so once you do that, once you pick your bird, um, it will give you information about that bird. It will tell you, it will give you pictures. It will show you um, the different sounds that the birds make and you can play that. It will show you where the bird lives at different times of year. So this is a really great resource to be learning about birds. And this app, um, I believe, also interfaces with eBird. So you can, um, by using this app, you can be submitting your observations as well. So now I'll move into, if someone had asked about jumping worms, they're curious about jumping worms in their garden. Um, and so another thing that you can do as a citizen scientist is monitor invasive species in your garden. And jumping worms are a newer invasive species in Wisconsin. You, they have, um, they look like this that you can see on the slide. They are, um, they vary in size, but you can tell them apart from European earthworms uh, because uh, they have, um, well, first they move around uh, re really pretty violently um, in a way that looks like jumping. Um, and you'll see that, I'll show you a video in just a second. Um, but they also have, um, this part is called the clitellum and on jumping worms that's white and it goes all the way around their body. So that's a good way to differentiate them from European earthworms. Another way that you can tell if you have jumping worms is by the soil texture. So someone else had mentioned soil texture and in a garden that, or in a natural area that jumping worms are present in, the soil will look kind of like coffee grounds, like really crumbly, um, a different texture. So that, um, if you have that soil texture, it is a pretty good indicator that you have jumping worms. And then one other part of the jumping worm life cycle are their cocoons um, where the baby worms hatch from. They're very small. You can see them next to this penny. Um, that's how they get transported between gardens and uh, between places is, oops, sorry, is their cocoons, which are really small, really hard to see. Um, so it makes sense that they could be spread very, very easily. And then, so here in this video, I'll show you the kind of defining feature why they're called jumping worms. 
play will play. There we go. So you can see they are so wiggly. They, they're even jumping right out of the ball there. They really live up to their name. So this is a very characteristic behavior that you, you can use to identify these worms. So if you see um, jumping worms in your garden, a good place to report them is to the Great Lakes Early Detection Network. And you can see um, this program will do something similar where they'll map observations that people are seeing. So you can see that um, some folks have reported jumping worms in Wisconsin. A lot of folks have reported jumping worms in Minnesota. Their jumping worms are a lot more prevalent than we're seeing here uh, because not a lot of people have been uh, taking data on them yet. So they're kind of new. You don't know that much about them. Uh, folks are trying to learn. And so this is a good way to help scientists learn about where they are and how we can control them. Another great option uh, to contribute to citizen science, um, if you're interested in jumping worms, is to keep an eye out from the UW Arboretum. They're releasing a new project this summer that um, is kind of looking at the interaction between jumping worms and different plant species. So it's a really great one for gardeners. Um, I'd encourage you to check out their website or email their ecologist, Brad Herrick, if you want to get involved in that project. Um, that will really help, um, help scientists learn about what's going on with jumping worms and what, what we can do about them. Then another project that is really fun to participate in in your garden is monarch butterfly monitoring. There are several projects that you could participate in in your garden. Um, one is Journey North, another is Project Monarch Health, and then there's the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. And through these projects, you as a citizen scientist can um, monitor monarchs all throughout their life cycle from an egg to a caterpillar through adulthood. Um, so there are lots of opportunities depending on what you're interested in. For the uh, Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, this is a project that's been going on for about 30 years. Um, it includes um, things like surveys for monarch eggs on milkweed plants. So if you have milkweed in your garden, this is really fun to go look for the eggs. Um, surveys of the larvae, uh, surveys of a sort of habitat, milkweed condition, and then there are also components um, that you could participate in that have to do with rearing monarchs. So I saw that somebody already um, in the comments had said that they rear monarchs and have been for a few years. So you could participate in this project. Um, this project is really exciting uh, because it develops, you can see as a participant, these kind of real-time data. And um, this is a chart from Wisconsin of all the observations from 2020. And the, on the bottom, on the x-axis is time. So we have um, from May all the way to September. And then the y-axis is the number of monarchs that are seen. And you can kind of see that we, late May, we start to get monarchs coming back. We get a big boom of monarchs in the summer. And as they're migrating, we can see their numbers um, sort of dropping off. So we can get a lot of information about what's happening with monarch butterflies um, in our area, which is really neat to see. Another project that you can participate in, if you're already rearing monarchs, this is a really good one because it's very low effort um, and helps health scientists understand um, this 
parasite uh, that's affecting some monarchs. So monarchs, especially in the south, um, are often infected uh, by this protozoan parasite called um, OE for short. And you can see with these little red arrows, um, those little tiny spheres, the little dots are spores of OE. And when monarchs are highly infected with this disease, they have trouble um, flying, they have trouble reproducing. And so it's pretty detrimental um, if there are high rates of infection to monarchs. So one thing that you can do if you're rearing them, this doesn't hurt monarchs at all, so it's safe to do, is you can take a little stamp of their abdomen and um, you'll get, um, if you sign up for this project, you'll give everything you need to do it. You can take a little sticky stamp of their abdomen and you can, you could actually look, if you have a microscope, you could look for these spores yourself or you could send uh, this away to the folks running this project and they can tell you about your monarchs and that helps them kind of understand uh, how, where this disease is, how it's affecting monarchs. Another really easy project to participate in for monarch butterflies is Journey North. And it's really easy because uh, once you see a monarch, you submit your observation and it gets added to the map. So a project like this, you can see uh, they can make these really exciting maps that show monarchs moving northward on their migration. And it's really exciting to see in real time, you can kind of uh, get an idea oops, sorry about that, of when, when monarchs might be in your area and how things are different in different years. Um, so you can submit your monarch sightings to Journey North. Another really great thing that you can do in your garden as a citizen scientist is to study phenology, which uh, phenology just means these um, changes of the seasons. So this is a really great one because it can cover any interest anything you're interested in. Um, so just observing and paying attention in your garden, you probably see things like, oh, this is when I see my first bluebird come in in March, in the spring, or I see witch hazel flowering in the fall, or I see all of these different flowers in the summertime. And so you probably are already studying phenology if you're a gardener, but I'll show you some tools that can help you uh, study it even a little bit more intricately. Um, so iNaturalist is a really great tool. I recommend it to everybody I see. Um, it's very fun to use. It's a website and an app, and you can use it to document any, any um, living thing that you see. So um, a lot of people use it to document plants and flowers, I use it a lot to document fungi. Um, you can document birds or animals. But once you, the premise is that you take a picture of what you're seeing and you can upload it. Um, it your observation will include your location. You can take multiple pictures. Um, but when you do that, it gets added to this uh, repository of data um, of observations that can be used by scientists, that can be accessed by um, anyone on iNaturalist. So you can see here, I grabbed just observations around, um, around Madison of um, just anything that was in the area. And you can see that there are tons of observations over 2,000 species that people had seen just in the Madison area. Um, you can see all of those dots are observations. Um, this must have been the late fall because people were seeing New England asters, uh, they're seeing golden rods, things like that. So it's a really great tool to document what you're seeing, if only for your records or to contribute um, to get a better idea of, for scientists or anybody, what's what's out there. 
So this is from my iNaturalist page. Like I said, I am using it a lot to document the fungi I'm seeing, but it's really nice because it, iNaturalist will keep all of your observations together. So you can see at this point, I had had 40 observations. I had seen 30 different species. Um, and here are all my pictures nicely organized of the fungi I had been seeing. It's a nice way to keep track of what's around when you're seeing it in your garden. iNaturalist has a really great app that um, has a lot of really nice features for being a citizen scientist. Um, so it, using the app, if you take a photo of something you see, I took a picture of this interesting looking fungi. Um, one nice feature of iNaturalist is that it will recommend um, an identification based on your photos. So if you take really good photos, um, you can, it, it has a really good algorithm for choosing what you're seeing. So I actually know what this, this uh, fungus is and it chose correctly for me, um, at least to the genus. So it, it's really nice. It's a really good tool to help you learn if, if I didn't know anything about fungi and I took this picture, um, I could learn the genus just, just like that um, from my naturalist telling me. So it's really nice for things, for plants you maybe can't identify in your garden, for organisms that you're curious about, it can really help you learn. Um, and it can do this for insects. Um, so here's an example of a butterfly that I had seen. I'm not very good at butterfly ID, but it uh, recommended uh, this identification to me. Another great thing about iNaturalist is that other citizen scientists can recommend um, and confirm your identifications. So this other person said that that's correct. That's what it is um, that you're seeing. And it keeps track of all these nice things for you. And in a way that can be accessed by researchers to learn a lot about um, all the different organisms that are being seen. So one more research resource, a final resource for you, is the um, Wisconsin Citizen-Based Monitoring Network. I kind of talked about this in the timeline of Wisconsin Citizen Science, but this they have a website that has a lot of good resources. Um, they have a calendar. They have um, ways to get involved, uh, ways for new projects to get started, resources. Um, so if you have an idea for a project or you're excited about something that I didn't talk about, there's probably a project out there that already exists that you could participate in. Or if there's not, this um, the Citizen Based Monitoring Network can help you get started um, to get that project going. So uh, like I said, this is a wonderful landing uh, place for you to go if you, if you're curious about citizen science, um, they host a conference that I'd recommend going to. Um, it, it's a really wonderful resource, so I'd highly recommend that. And with that, I'd just like to encourage you uh, to get outside when you can and try some citizen science in your garden. Um, so just remember to be curious and to ask questions and you have all the tools you need to get started. And with that, I'm happy to take questions from you. If you want to know about other projects that I can help with, I'd be happy to share that information as well if I have it. But thanks for taking the time to listen to and learn how to be a citizen scientist with me. So I have some questions coming in already um, in the chat, which is great. So one, this is a really good question. How, um, how important are these, are the observations of citizen scientists? And do, do, does this really make a difference, the data that citizen scientists collect? Um, 
Yeah, so definitely, this is incredibly important, um, especially in natural resources. There are not a lot of people who are lucky enough to be paid to be scientists um, in natural resources. So um, for, I mean, there are plenty of examples, but just thinking about monarch butterflies, the reason that we know so much about the life cycle of monarch butterflies is because there have been these projects around for 30 years. Um, the reason that monarch butterflies were um, up for being listed uh, as a federally protected species is because we have these 30 years of data from citizen scientists. If we didn't have people collecting information about them, there wouldn't be enough information for scientists to say one way or another if these needed to be protected. Um, so it's really important. A lot of um, a lot of scientists now are collecting, are using the data from things like eBird and iNaturalist to get an idea of how we can best protect species that are uh, threatened, of how we can take care of our natural areas, of how we can manage things better to ensure that we have resilient ecosystems. So I'd say that a lot of these data are really important in sort of making sure that we have a vital system uh, that's really working well. Um, so someone also asked um, an example of what we know now because, citizen, because of a citizen science project that we might not have known without citizens participating. Well, I think a good example of something we will know is um, so we don't, things like invasive species are pretty new. We don't know a whole lot about them because they haven't been here for a long time. So something like uh, jumping worms, we don't know where really where they are, um, sort of what plants they associate with. So the Arboretum's new project, um, they're set to learn a lot about where, where people are finding these jumping worms. Um, what plants they're associating with, how we can manage them better. And that has a real impact for gardeners, for regular folks, uh, for land managers, for all sorts of people. So there, there are plenty of examples, lots and lots of examples. Um, these data, I think there are numbers that um, say the value of observations from citizen scientists is valued in the billions of dollars. Um, so it's it's a really important, really great um, thing to have these observations from citizen scientists. Any other questions? I asked too many questions earlier. It made everyone tired. <laughs> well, let's see. Um, so someone asked a question. Oh, can eBird idea bird from somebody trying to mimic a call? I can't say I've ever tried it. Um, it might be worth a try. Another thing that you can do if you have Merlin, that app um, that I had talked about, you can kind of narrow down what you might be seeing or what might be present in your garden. And you can kind of compare the calls that way, um, compare things that you might be seeing. Uh, but I guess it's worth a try. It maybe depends on how good you are at mimicking a bird call. Someone mentioned that Audubon has some projects too. So I think that's great. Um, Audubon does do a lot of important work with citizen science. Um, and this, this list of projects that I gave you is by no means exhaustive. There are so many projects you could participate in. So whatever makes you feel excited is really what you should do. Oh, okay. Um, someone says, I love the lifelong learning aspect of citizen science. Me too. Um, and how it can also deepen our connection with the natural world. 
Um, does the iNaturalist app tell you not tell you to not eat poisonous mushrooms? I would say the first rule of looking for mushrooms is don't eat anything that you can't 100% identify um, because it could be the difference between you being alive right now or not anymore. Um, so some mushrooms, even if you just eat a little bit, really poisonous could just kill you. Um, so I'd recommend instead of using an app to tell you what you can eat, going out with folks who really know, who have lots of experience, who have done foraging, things like that. Um, that's a good way to learn what you can eat if you're excited about eating things. Um, but it is a good way to sort of learn about um, like how mushrooms are related or how to identify different mushrooms. So it can kind of teach you some of those things, some of the tools you would need. But I would say never ever eat anything that you're not 100% sure about. Even I, I'm pretty good at identification. I still get nervous about eating things that I find. So I would say just be really careful. Okay, does anybody else have any, have anything? Oh, here we go. Okay, so question, will the jumping worm research give us an idea of how to control them? Um, let's see. So as you could see from the jumping worm slide, their cocoons are so small and hard to see. There are a couple of things that you can do to, to, to try to control jumping worms. And the Arboretum is a great resource for learning about these things as well. Their ecologist is kind of on the cutting edge of jumping worm research. So to keep them out of your garden, um, you wanna make sure that you're buying your plants from, uh, I guess a reputable dealer who is paying attention to things like that. If you're introducing mulch or compost, it has to be heated to a certain temperature to keep them away. Um, there was some research about some products that could be applied to get rid of jumping worms, but the product um, isn't made anymore. So I think there's a lot of research going on and there's a potential for that project to kind of morph into um, including some control measures for jumping worms. But I think they're still kind of in the information gathering stage where they don't know a whole lot. So they need more information so that they can start uh, to get a plan of how to how they could be controlled. Your kitty telling us that it's maybe oh, time to talk to me. Other. That's mine. He gets fed at three, so he starts tuning up around two. <laughs> Sorry <Good> about that. <laughs> okay, unless anyone else has any questions, I guess we'll end here. And I want to thank Jessica for coming. Jessica for coming. This was really great. And um, we don't have any lectures scheduled for the summer. We'll start up again in the fall, but there are some walks and there's some bike rides posted and some other things. Um, activities for the summer if you want to check our website um but other than that as far as lectures go we'll see everybody in the fall and jessica thanks again thank you so much for having me okay